Romans chapter 8. Uh, we will look at verses 23 to 25, but I will read uh, verses 18 uh, to 25. <clears throat> this is Romans chapter 8. reading from verses 18 to 25, and looking at verses 23 to, 20, 23 to 25. <clears throat> For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we worship you, and we worship you for your Son, for sending your Son in Christ alone. Our hope is found. All other ground is sinking sand. There is no solid foundation other than him. And I pray that you will root us and ground us in Christ that he will truly be our foundation in the midst of our lives. As we look forward to the day of his return, whether that be soon or far away, that is where our hope is found. And Heavenly Father, I pray and that this morning you will speak to our hearts from your word, and Lord, that you will be pleased to fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me. That your name will be praised, that your Son will be praised, Lord, that we will stay strong in the hope that you have given to us. In Jesus' name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Amen. Well, while there are plenty of uh, internet articles that will tell you the science of why people sigh, the Christian sigh is very different. It is a deep inward groan that conveys a longing for the better country, and that is the heavenly one, for the city that has foundations and whose builder and designer is God. Now we walk as pilgrims in this world, strangers in a strange land, who experience suffering in various degrees and in various ways. Now, we might walk through the valley of humiliation as John Bunyan's character Christian did in his Pilgrim's Progress, or be captured and put in the prison of giant despair. We might experience persecution on account of righteousness or persecution on account of Christ's name. We might experience the common aches and pains of old age. And anyone who lives and grows older knows those aches and pains very well. And I'm sure many of you can tell me all about that. Perhaps we've watched loved ones wither with a debilitating disease. And so we sigh and we groan inside because we long for something better. I remind you again that the section that we are going through here in Romans 8 from verses 18 to the end of this chapter deal with the subject of suffering in the present time. The assurance of suffering, assurance given in suffering, I should say. And the Apostle Paul has made his daring claim in verse 18, his bold statement, where he said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Yet we must admit that in the midst of our sufferings, we don't always think about the future glory that is to be revealed to us. We sit under sufferings and sometimes we plain forget it. It goes out of our minds all to 
together, will the future glory outweigh and outshine the present sufferings? Well, this is what Paul is saying, and he begins to give a symphony of sighs, as it has been called, where creation sighs, creation groans, and it is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed on that day. And we looked at that last, last week, that stands on its tiptoes, eagerly awaiting and the revealing of the sons of God, it sighs and groans under the curse of God, and yet it has hope itself that one day the sons of God, the children of God, will be revealed. One day creation will be liberated, delivered from its bondage to decay and corruption when the Lord Jesus Christ comes from heaven. Yet for now it groans and sighs. Yet creation is not the only one that sighs and groans. We as Christians also join in the symphony of sighs. The, third, the second movement, if you will, in the symphony of sighs is that Christians also sigh. And the third movement is the spirit sigh, found in verses 26 to 27, which we will, Lord willingly, look at next week. For now, let us look at the Christian sigh. We first see that the Christian sigh arises from the Holy Spirit. We read in verse 23, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, I think it is very safe to say that all people long for and look for better days in this world. They long for the peace in the midst of war, health in the midst of sickness, and success in the midst of failure. Yet their longing is only for comfort in this present time, an ease of suffering in the now, so that they can go continue with their business, continue with life as it is. Their longing is always for temporal things. Their longing is rooted in this present age, not in the age to come. Thus they might have the ambitious goals of cleaning up the environment or voting for such and such a leader in hopes that that leader will make a better president, mayor, or school board official. Yet their emphasis is always on the present age, the present time, the temporal relief of the bad days, as it were. But the Christian's emphasis is different. It flows from something very deep within us. The, the emphasis in the opening phrase falls on Christians. We ourselves, the verse says, are the ones who groan inwardly. We ourselves are the ones who sigh and long, not for present prosperity, but for future glory. Christians groan inwardly and sigh deeply and sigh. We cannot pass over this and discard it. There is something very deep within us that longs for and sighs for the better days to come. Not that the ease of suffering in this life will end, that we hope for that as well, but for the days ahead, the future glory that is going to be revealed one day. It is a glory that will far outweigh our present sufferings. Where does this sigh come from? Where does it originate from? Well, Christians are described as those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Well, what does this mean? What does it mean that we have the first fruits of the Spirit? Now, the term first fruit is a word that describes the first portion from the harvest, the first gleanings of wheat, the first portion of olive oil or wine that they made. The Lord told the Israelites to bring them to him and to his tabernacle. Yet the first fruit also told of a coming harvest, a greater harvest than what they first pick. It's kind of as when we go out to our garden and we pick a few tomatoes that have ripened early. That's the first fruit. But there's so many more tomatoes hanging on. They're just not ripe yet. That's kind of what it means, that there is a greater harvest to come. Now, we note that the apostle uses the word first fruit to describe the spirit. The spirit is the first fruit that the Christians possess. Well, what does he mean by this? Again, the first fruit is the first portion of the wheat or olives or grapes, and it told of a greater harvest to come. 
Thus the Holy Spirit is like the first kernels of grain that are given to us, the first pints of fresh olive oil or wine that come from the vineyard, from the olive trees. The Spirit within the Christian signifies a greater harvest to come. Now consider for a moment the greatness of the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Trinity. He has all the attributes of God. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere present. In fact, David said in Psalm 139, Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? The spirit is the ancient spirit who hovered over the primordial waters in the darkness, waiting for God to say, Let there be light and begin the creation process. He is called the Counselor, the Comforter, the Advocate by Jesus. This is the Spirit who searches everything, even the depths of God. And He is the one who dwells within us. He is the first fruit that God has given to us. He pours the love of God into our hearts and brings with Him abundant life. And this is only a fraction of the greatness of the Holy Spirit whom we have within us. Now, if the Spirit is the first fruit, consider the greater harvest, the greater glory that is going to come. A greater future glory that outweighs our present suffering. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the Christian's heart, He spreads a fine feast for him or her, the Christian tastes the richness and the sweetness of the Spirit's banquet. He sets forth the milk of the Word for the infants among his people, and sets forth the, the meat and the potatoes, as it were, for the more mature to eat. He sets forth the rich wine of God's love and pours it into our hearts. He sets the silver bowls of his fruit on the table, and that when Christians eat of it, they begin to reflect that fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yet the Spirit is only the first fruit of a greater harvest, a greater glory that is to come. The Apostle used a similar expression in Ephesians 1.14 where he said that the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Spirit is the down payment, as it were, of the inheritance that we will one day receive. It's only, a, as it were, a small fraction. And yet if the Spirit is only but a fraction. How great is that glory that we will receive? When we have the Spirit as the first fruit of a greater harvest to come, we sigh and groan inwardly for the greater harvest. We groan inwardly, we sigh deeply for future glory. Now when we are young and full of life and energy, we fall down and we get back up and run. We don't tend to think about the future glory. But as we age, both, both physically and in our, our faith, there's a groaning that takes place. We have experienced the bitterness of life. We have experienced those aches and pains in our bodies. We see all around us and we groan inwardly. We carry around this body of death and struggle with indwelling sin. Our bodies are racked with sicknesses and cancer, dementia and other mental diseases steal the personalities of our loved ones. Our bodies grow frail with old age, and we attend many more funerals than we, we wish to. As we gaze on the world at large and see a tsunami of evil arising out of the depths, do we not, as Christians, groan inwardly and want something better than what we have today? Amen. Of course we do. We have tasted the sweetness. We have tasted the richness. We have tasted that the Lord is good, that the Spirit of the living God is good. And we long for the glory to come. It's kind of like the other day, as Grace was baking a cake. You probably had this experience as well. But the children got licks of the icing, the frosting, and thankfully the husband was included in that. <laughs> but here it is. 
when they taste it, they want more. They know that more is coming, that the cake is going to be baked and full. But they have to eat their, their main meal and their vegetables first before they get that. It's kind of like this with the first fruit of the Spirit. We've tasted it, and we long for more. But it's not yet. It's coming, but not yet. We have seen that our sigh arises from the Spirit. Now let us see that our sigh waits for adoption, that is, the redemption of our bodies. We again read in verse 23, And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now creation waits for glory. It waits for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. As we learn from verse 19, yet as we as Christians also eagerly await the glory to come, what particular aspect of glory do we wait for, do we long for? It is our adoption. Now, this is what we sigh and yearn after. And you might very well say, wait a second, I thought we were already adopted. What, what do you mean we're waiting eagerly for it? What does that mean? Yes, we are already adopted by God, but the adoption process is not yet completed. It is not yet finished. God's Word declares that we are already adopted by God the Father. Those whom the Spirit regenerates, that is, those who are born again, those whom God declares righteous, they are the children of God. The ones who received Jesus and believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. As the Apostle John tells us, these are the ones who receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are now, we are God's children now. Now in this present age, yes, we are the children of God. These verses and other verses in the New Testament declare that we are already the children of God. The papers are signed by the blood of Christ. It is a done deal. The legal issues of our lack of righteousness are taken care of. They are fulfilled by Christ's righteousness. We are no longer strangers. We are reconciled to God. We are not illegitimate children. God has rightfully and lawfully adopted us. This is a great encouragement to us. Yet then, wait a minute, I thought you said that we were eagerly awaiting adoption. What does that mean? Well, it's defined for us here in this verse. It means the redemption of our bodies. We are already adopted by God, but the process is not yet finished. The final aspect of our adoption, according to this verse, is the redemption of our bodies. We know from Romans 3.24 that we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We also read in Ephesians 1.7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. The Lord Jesus shed His blood to redeem us, to purchase us from among the nations and grant us forgiveness of sins as we read in His Word, as we have looked at before in Romans. This is incredible, yet the redemption is not yet complete. The adoption is not yet complete. In order for it to be complete, we must have our resurrected bodies. We are, have not yet received our glorified bodies. Our bodies are not yet redeemed, to use the Apostle's words. Charles Hodge said, We wait for the time when our vile bodies shall be fashioned like unto the glorious body of the Son of God. We are not fated to be spirits floating around in heaven. No, no, the Bible teaches us that there is a resurrection that will take place one day. When the Lord Jesus comes, in 1 John 3, 2, it sums it up. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. Our adoption is not yet complete until our bodies are fully redeemed. This reminds us of two truths. One, it reminds us that our bodies are actually important to God. 
Our culture has bought the lie that our bodies do not count, that they do not matter in the scheme of things. Author and Christian professor Nancy R. Piercy makes a startling claim in her book, Love Thy Body. She says that the key to understanding all the controversial issues of our day is that the concept of the human being has likewise been fragmented into an upper and lower story. Secular thought today assumes a body slash person split with a body defined in the fact realm by empirical science, the lower story, and the person defined in the values realm as the basis for rights, the upper story. She calls this upper lower story thinking personhood theory and says to be biologically human is a scientific fact, but to be a person is an ethical concept defined by what we value. Therefore, these people can say, abortion doesn't matter, go ahead, do it. These people will say that if your loved one has dementia, go ahead and euthanasia, do you euthanize her or him. These are the ones who struggle with gender confusion and issues of homosexuality and the hookup culture because the body to them doesn't matter. You are a, how you as a person are defined is by what culture says you are, the values of the culture. And this is how they undermine it. But here in the Bible, God created both body and soul. Here in the Bible, in this particular verse, the body is important to God because one day Christ Jesus is going to come and one day our bodies will rise from the dead. Christ redeemed those bodies, our bodies. That is what here in the Bible tells us. Even some Christians have a habit of emphasizing only the soul, forgetting that Christ redeems even our bodies as well. They will picture our bodies like a spacesuit, only waiting and urging to get out and be free in heaven. But no, that's not our final destination. The biblical picture is a physical resurrection of our bodies. The dead in Christ will rise first, the apostle declared, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. We, as Christians, look forward to the time when we will have resurrected bodies, when our bodies will finally and fully be redeemed. Yes, as the Apostle Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Yes, I believe that our souls will ascend to heaven, but that's not the final destination. The final destination will come when that trump will resound and the Lord will descend. And we will rise from the dead and forever be with him with our resurrected bodies. This is the picture of what our hope is. The body is important enough for God to redeem through Christ. And this leads us to the next major truth. Christ's blood redeems the whole of us, not just our souls, but our bodies as well. Not just the spirit part, but the physical as well. We have learned from the book of Romans that the blood of Christ has saved us from the wrath of God. It is the ground for our justification. It is the ground for our reconciliation with God. It forgives us of sins. But now here, another wonderful aspect of the blood of Christ is that it redeems the, our bodies as well. Christ assumed flesh and blood to redeem our souls as well as our bodies. He shed his blood so that even our bodies will one day be restored and be made new in light of the resurrection of the dead. The mature fruit of his death will be our heavenly renovation. To phrase borrowed by John Calvin, when this perishable body must put on the imperishable and the mortal body must put on immortality. Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection assures us that we too will rise again from the dead. We sigh for our complete adoption, our glorified bodies. We wait for the redemption of that time to come. We experience fatigue in life. We wake up to back pains and sicknesses, the aches and pains of old age. We watched our loved ones decay with dementia struggle with cancer or another debilitating disease. We have accidents that injure a part of our body that affects us for the rest of our lives. We attend funerals and grieve the loss of loved ones. We sigh, do we not, for the glory to come? 
Yet this is only, not only this, but we also experience the weaknesses of the flesh. We struggle with indwelling sin. We feel the tug of our bodies when we long to pray and read the Bible, and yet fall asleep on the couch or turn on the TV or something else. We know Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We sigh for our complete adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Perhaps it's like a child when he is adopted. All the legal issues are taken care of, the papers are signed. Now the only thing that, that awaits is for the, his new parents to come and pick him up at the orphanage. And it's that time frame where he's waiting, he's hoping, he's longing to go home to his new home, to have a mom and dad that care for him. Not to be alone, left with the, the bullies of the, the orphanage or whatever it might be. Longing to have a home-cooked meal again. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's adopted. Everything is taken care of. But it hasn't fully happened yet. And that's where we are as well. We are adopted. The legal issues are done. Christ has redeemed us. We are adopted by God the Father. He has put His Spirit in us to cry out, Abba, Father, to Him. But it's not done yet. Not done. So we have seen that our sigh arises from the Spirit and waits for our adoption. Now let us see that our sigh leads to hope. We read in verses 24 and 25, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now we as Christians clearly sigh, we groan inwardly, and the sigh arises from the Spirit and who dwells within us. And as, as an object of resurrected bodies, and as Christians who long for our complete adoption, we travel the avenue of hope. Hope is not wishful thinking as saying, I hope my team wins. You, when you know that your team isn't really good, <laughs> you hope that it won't rain this afternoon when the weather forecast has predicted rain. Not today, but another day perhaps. That's wishful thinking. Hope is something different. It's a confident expectation of God and His promises. R.C. Sproul defined it like this, Hope is faith looking forward, it is faith being certain, and receiving assurance of what God promises for tomorrow. So let us travel down this avenue of hope for a moment. We, as we begin to walk down this avenue of hope, we will first see that hope saturates our salvation. We read in verse 24, We were saved in hope. Well, what does this mean? How do we understand this? It cannot mean that it is the instrument by which we are saved, that is faith. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So it cannot mean that. It means that hope permeates our salvation. It saturates it. Put it another way, imagine walking in a city called Salvation. And its grand monu monuments stretch toward the heaven of Christ's work on the cross and of his resurrection and of the many great and wonderful promises that we have in his word. As we per peruse the city of salvation, we see the banners and decorations of hope everywhere where we, we look. When we look at Christ's death, there is hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, one of our hymns says. When we look at the empty tomb, there is hope, because the one who died is again alive and ascended to heaven. When we look at the many promises of his word, there is hope spread across there. It's saturated. The city of salvation, as it were, is saturated with hope. Put it another way, it's an ingredient. It's like cinnamon for cinnamon sugar cookies. It's not the major ingredient, but cinnamon permeates permeates the cookie. It's it not saturates with water, but it's all over the cookie so that when you bite into it, you taste the cinnamon. Or like chocolate, if you, if you like chocolate instead. It's like that. It saturates the thing that you are baking so that when they taste it, it's chocolate. That's what it means. Let us also see second that hope anticipates the unseen reality. This is a description of hope. We read in verse 23, Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. One of the characteristics of hope 
One of its descriptions is that it holds on to the unseen, the yet fulfilled promises of God. The promise is not fulfilled yet. The prophecies are not consummated yet. Hope anticipates them as if they were already realities. The specific hope referred to in this passage is the hope of our, the redemption of our bodies, our resurrected bodies. We do not have them yet, but we hope for that day when we will have them. We could describe hope like a little girl whose father promised her an ice cream sundae after work. She knows her father is trustworthy and knows he will come through with that promise. And so trust, that's faith. But now comes the waiting process. Now comes the hoping process. Now comes the confident expectation that, hey, I'm gonna get an ice cream sundae today. And so throughout the day, she's waiting. She goes to her mom. Mommy, when's daddy coming home? Oh, not yet, it's only nine o'clock. 10 minutes later, mommy, when's daddy coming home? <laughs> not yet, and so on and so forth throughout the day at lunchtime. Is, it, is daddy coming home? No, not yet. It's only lunch, we're eating lunch. And so on, until finally her dad comes home. And she may hope for that. She may, and that ice cream sundae, she may hope for that sundae. That's what hope is. But it is not until she is sitting down in that ice cream sundae that's smothered with chocolate syrup and purple and pink and blue sprinkles are there that that hope is reality that hope actually ceases at that point because there is that ice cream sundae. It's like that with us. We are hoping for something in the future. It's not there yet, but one day we are assured of it will be there. And this leads us to the next aspect of hope. Hope implies patient endurance or perseverance. We read verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We eagerly wait with patience for the redemption of our bodies. And this word patience is the same as endurance, translated in Romans 5, and carries with it the idea of patient endurance. If we have a confident expectation that something will happen, we wait with endurance for it. We stick to it. We keep on keeping on as the phrase goes. I've ha not had the chance to watch any of the Summer Olympics taking place in Paris. I'm sure most of those athletes will tell you about endurance, this patient endurance. Hours and hours of practice, hours and hours of competition, finally to, do, to get at the Olympic level to compete with the other athletes. They do it to get a medal of gold or silver or bronze, but we wait with patience for something far greater and far more glorious than gold and silver and bronze. We patiently endure the aches and pains of our body, the cancers and sicknesses, the persecution and ostracization of the world against us, because our hope is rooted in God and His Word. <clears throat> One day, in our resurrected bodies, we will not feel those aches and pains anymore. Cancers and sicknesses and diseases will be things of the past. They will not be there on that day. One day, persecution will end. For now, we must patiently endure. The little girl must wait patiently for her ice cream sundae. It will come, but she must wait. The Lord Jesus will come and redeem our bodies, but right now, we have to wait to endure. So we have seen the sigh of the Christian arises from the Spirit, waits for complete adoption, the redemption of our bodies, and this leads to hope. So what do we do with it? One, only God's adopted children will share in this. And if you do not know Him today, if you are not part of God's family, then believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. If you do not believe in Him, you are not a child of God and therefore will miss out. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Two, stir up your hope. Remind yourself again of this glorious hope that we have. Remember it in the midst of your sufferings. The time that we are most often 
to forget the future glory is in the midst of our sufferings. So stir it up, remember it, read the promises of God, read about it, think about it, ponder that the Spirit of God lives and dwells within you. That's the first fruit. Ponder that your adoption is not complete. You're waiting for the redemption of your bodies. Ponder it, think of it. No glorious day when we will have our resurrected bodies. Suffering and pain and sin and sickness do not have the last word. God has the last word. Therefore, stir up hope in yourselves. Three, take comfort in the midst of this. These glorious truths comfort us in the midst of our sorrows of suffering. Many of us have lost loved ones in the Lord. Well, guess what? There's the day coming you when you will see them again. We will gather together with Christ and so forever be with them and with Him. When family and friends ostracize you because of your faith in Jesus, then comfort yourselves with these truths. The very sigh in you testifies that there is greater glory to come. And four, endure. We as Christians will suffer in this life. This is the plain, honest truth of the Bible. We suffer in a variety of ways, yet God calls us to endure, to stick to it, to look forward to the hope that we have, to look forward to the glory that will come, to stick with it, to patiently endure. So endure, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the great and precious promises that we have in your word. And I pray, Lord, that we will hold on to these promises and never waver from them. Let it strengthen our faith in the days that we suffer, no matter what suffering that looks like. Let these truths come to our mind. Let the Spirit bring them to our minds. We may truly hope and hope in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, please turn or your hymnals, please turn to 467. Our God and hope, our hope in ages past. 